Luke. The Gospel of Luke. And I want you to look with me in Luke chapter 7. Luke chapter 7. And I want to talk to you this morning about the centurion who became a Christian. Luke chapter 7. And let's see here if I can get this to stop. I'm going to get this figured out one of these days. There we go. Luke chapter 7. And look with me in verse number 1. Now when he, when he had ended all his sayings in the audience of the people, he entered into Capernaum. And there was a certain centurion servant who was dear unto him, was sick and ready to die. And when he heard of Jesus, he sent unto him the elders of the Jews, beseeching him that he would come and heal his servant. And when they came to Jesus, they besought him instantly, saying that he was worthy for whom he should do this. For he loveth our nation, and hath, uh, he hath built us a synagogue. Now I'll stop there for the sake of time this morning, but again, I want to talk to you about the centurion who became a Christian. Let's bow together. Our Heavenly Father, we come to you in Jesus' name, and Lord, we thank you for the opportunity that we've had to be here today. And, and Lord, I pray for each one that's here, I pray that you would help us to have our, our hearts and our minds focused on the Word of God. And Lord, I pray that you'd help us to see what we need. I pray that you'd help us to examine ourselves, to, to be sure that we're where we ought to be in our own Christian life and our spiritual walk with you. But Lord, if there's one here this morning that's never trusted you, I pray that today would be the day when they said yes to Jesus and they trust you. But Lord, for those of us who are saved and on our way to heaven, we pray that you would encourage us. And Lord, draw us closer to you. Holy Spirit, Lord, I pray that you would help me to just fade away this morning. They would not hear me, but they would hear from you. And Lord, I pray that you'll speak through me, help me to hide behind the cross, and tell only what you have me to say. In Jesus' name, amen. You can be seated. You know, we're, we're living in a day and age at a time of rebellion. Pretty much rebellion everywhere you look. As, uh, kids are rebelling against parents, they're rebelling against authority. And it's, sometimes we tend to think, well, it's worse than it's ever been. Well, I don't know if it's worse than it's ever been. It seems like it's worse than it's ever been since I've been around, which is not that long, relatively speaking. But we see a lot of things that are happening. We see rebellion all around us. And, and rebellion's always been around. But in fact, it was rebellion that began this whole mess of sin to begin with. Amen? Amen. If you look back in, uh, and I'm going to turn there in Isaiah chapter 14. But in Isaiah chapter 14, you know, some, sometimes people ask, say, well, well, why did God create the devil? God didn't create the devil. God created a, a perfect being. God created a being called Lucifer, and he put him in charge of this world, and he put him in charge of a third of the, of the angels. And so he was, a, he was a created being. He was perfect, but one day he decided that he didn't want to be under authority anymore. And so in, in Isaiah chapter 14, it talks about it. And I'll, I'll just read it to you. Verse number 12, Isaiah 14, 12, it says, O how art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? How art thou cut down to the ground, which didst weaken the nations? For thou hast said in thy heart, now get this, he says five times, he says, I will. He, he wants to do something that God doesn't want him to do. And he's in rebellion, and he's throwing off the authority. Listen to what he says. For thou hast said in thine heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will sit also upon the mount of the congregation in the sides of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the Most High. And yet he goes on to tell about how his judgment would come. But you see, Satan became Satan when he said, I want to throw away uh, the authority that's over me. I don't want to be under God's authority anymore. I, I, want to be, I, I want to be my own boss. I want to do my own thing. I'm just as good as anybody else. Listen, everybody has an authority. We've all got an authority somewhere. There's a, there's a divine pecking order, so to speak. When you read the New Testament, you read through there, keep in mind, especially when you read the Gospels, but all through the New Testament, you find that the nation of Israel was an occupied country. They were, they were occupied by the Romans. And so there's armies all through the New Testament. That's why you find it again and again, military terms in the Bible. When you read through there, you find about armies and, and legions and bands and officers and captains, centurions and soldiers 
It was an occupied country. There are no less than seven centurions spoke of in the New Testament. It talks about them. And it, it, each one is portrayed as a, as, a, as a good man, a man of discipline, somebody who has risen through the ranks in the service there. And so here they are. They're trained. They're disciplined. And their training produced a strength of character far above their peers. And so they rose to the top. Now, one of those men, and he's a good man. Look, look at verse 2. If you're there in, in, uh, in Luke chapter 7, I want you to see something in Luke 2. And we may look at a couple of verses uh, as we look there. I'm sorry, Luke chapter 7 and verse 2, where he says, uh, he, says there was a, a, he had a servant who was sick. And it says in verse number 2, and a centur certain centurion servant who was dear unto him was sick. This centurion was a was a, a man who was not afraid to show affection for somebody else. He said, you know, I like this guy. This guy is, I love this guy. This guy is dear to me. And so when he got sick, the centurion said, said uh, I, I, want to, I want to try to help you. He was no respecter of persons. He didn't say, well, now I'm the centurion and I'm the, I'm the soldier, I'm the leader, you know, I'm the big guy. No, it wasn't big me and little you. It was, hey, if I can help you, I will. And so here he was, he was sick, and he loved him. He was dear to him. Look down in verse number, uh, oh, look at verse number five. In verse number five, when the, when the religious leaders sent to the, uh, to the Lord, they said, he loves our nation. This man... Was a, was a man who was willing to show his affection for others. He wasn't, he wasn't caught up in himself. He wasn't all selfish and it wasn't all about him. And so when one of his servants got sick, he sent to the Lord and said, Lord, I need for you to heal this guy. And what this man said, look down in verse, uh, look down in verse, uh, verse number 9. Look at the last line of verse 9. And this is what we're going to look at. Because what this man said... Caused Jesus to say, I have never seen faith like this man has. He says there, the last line of verse 9 says, I have not found so great faith. No, not in Israel. So whatever there was about this man's faith, we can learn from it and we can benefit from it as we look at it. And it is the principle of authority. Look at verse number 8. Verse number 8 says, I also am a man under authority. Now, he sent to Jesus, and he said, now, now, Jesus, I want you to, if you would, come and heal this guy. And so he sent for him, but then he started having second thoughts, and he said, no, I'm not, I'm not worthy for Jesus to come. All he has to do is just send a word. And so he sends servants and says, hey, you don't even have to come. Just speak the word. But notice what he said. There's one key word in verse number 8 that stands out. He says, I also. That word also is the key. That word also, he is showing that he knows that Jesus is under authority. What he's saying is, look, I understand that you have your power because you are under authority. Jesus was under the authority of God and so when this guy speaks to Jesus, he says, hey, I know how authority works. I'm under authority too. You see what I'm saying? He's saying, look, I understand. And that's what caused Jesus to say, I have, uh, I have never seen this much faith, no one not of Israel. You see, you've got to understand, all authority is derived from a higher power. It never originates in man. It all begins with God. From the dawn of history, God put man in charge. Man fell. And man who is not right with God can never be fully in charge. And he can never be right with God until he's right with God through the shed blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. You've got to trust Christ. Romans chapter 13 and verse 1 tells us about authority. Romans chapter 13 verse 1 says, let, let every man be subject unto the higher power, for there was no power but of God. The powers that be are ordained of God. Now, I am to be subject to higher powers. I am under subject to God. I'm subjugated to what God has said. And so as long as my government doesn't tell me that I have to do something that God says I can't do or that I shouldn't do, I can be in subjection to the government. There's not a place for us to rebel just because we don't like the way they're spending the taxes or just because we don't like how they're doing stuff. We get a chance to vote and we do that when we can. But listen, 
Ultimately, I am answerable to God. And if I'm answerable to God and I'm living for Him, then I have authority. Amen. Jesus said, uh, He said many things. And one time they sent to the... Uh, they sent some leaders to Jesus and they said, go get him and bring him back. And he didn't come back with them. And they said, where is he? And they said, no man spake with it. He, he, he didn't talk like anybody else that we've ever seen. And it says, because he spoke with authority. You see, I can stand here and in authority, I can tell you that if you'll trust Christ as your Savior, you'll have a home in heaven. That's not my idea. That's God's idea. I can stand here and tell you that if you'll honor God with your life, He will bless you. That's not my idea. That's God's idea. And so I have the authority because I'm just passing the message on from God and giving it to you. When a policeman is directing traffic, a policeman is standing out there and directing traffic, that policeman <clears throat> doesn't stop you by his power. He stops you by his authority. He's got the authority of the state to tell you which way to turn and, and, and which way to go. Everybody has a higher power to be subject to. Employees, wives, husbands, children, all are to be into subjection and under subjection of their authority. In the church, we ordain pastors and elders and leaders to be responsible and to act for the church. You see... I am responsible for this church and I am accountable for this church. I, it's my job to lead this church forward and to do the things that God would have us to do. Sometimes they work, Brother Bob, and sometimes they don't. But God looks at our heart. Amen. Amen. I mean, God knows we, <laughs> we need to look over a lot of stuff with us. Amen. It's turn. Amen. Amen. Hebrews chapter 13 and verse number 17, the Bible says, Obey them that have rule over you and submit yourselves for they watch for your souls as they that must give an account. I am going to have to give an account one day for what Meadow Drive Baptist Church did while I was a pastor. And so I'm responsible to lead the church in going forward. I am under authority. I also am under authority. But in every aspect of life, authority is derived from God. Authority only comes through submission to the higher authority. And when the centurion sent to Jesus and asked for help, he, he expressed that. He said, look, I understand you because I also am a man under authority. Now think about this. Look at the nature of his position. He was a Roman soldier. He had dedicated himself to the, the, the Roman government and the Roman emperor. He could say he was under authority because he had completely surrendered to his superior and to his nation. Uh, a soldier was not permitted to say that, that he had any possessions of his own. He had no will of his own. His time was not his own. His uniform was ordered for him by someone else. Even his food was prescribed and prepared by someone else. By law, Roman soldiers held no permanent possessions. He may have family, but if he was a soldier, they had no claim on him. He belonged to the nation. He belonged to the city of Rome. He belonged to the emperor. He was the property of the emperor and the empire. The same principle operates in the spiritual realm. You see, there's no real divine authority without submission to Christ. The only way that you're going to be happy, and I know, you know, sometimes we sit there and we listen and we hear the preacher say something and we say, well, I knew he was going to say that. He's the preacher and, and he's getting paid to say that. No, I say it because it's true. The only way you're going to be happy is to submit your life to the Lord Jesus Christ. That's the only way. The principle is true. Total surrender to everything to the will of Jesus Christ our Lord. Jesus said, If any man come to me and hate not his father and his mother and his wife and his children and his brethren and his sisters, yea, and his own life also cannot be my disciple. And then in the very next verse he says, And whosoever does not bear his own cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. There ought to be such a love. You say, well, is he saying we ought to hate our brothers and sisters and we ought to actively hate them? No. Bless his heart, he wanted to hear some good preaching this morning. <laughs> there he goes out the door. <laughs> Thank you, Miss Morgan. <laughs> Lord's good, eh? Amen. Amen. 
Uh, Miss Turner, God bless you. Good to see you. Thank you. Bless your heart. It's always a blessing when you're here. It's not easy for you to get here, but you're here. Amen? Amen. Thank you. <laughs> Why, you know, we, we think, you know, Jesus said to hate our, hate our mother and our, our father and our, and our children. Are we supposed to actively hate them? I don't think that he meant we're to actively hate them. Here's what I think. I think what he's saying is that, you know, I love my wife. I, I love my mother. I love my family. And, and, and I love my children. But the love that I have for them ought to pale in comparison to the love I have for Jesus Christ. Amen. In other words, the love that I have for Christ should be such a great love and such an overwhelming love that the love for my family looks like hatred. You say, you do all that for Jesus? Yes, I would. I'd do all that for Jesus. I'd lay down my life for Jesus. I'd lay down my life for my wife and my family. But I love the Lord first and foremost, and He is first in my life. And so when you put Him first, then everything else seems to fall into place. The nature of His position was one of submission. Secondly, the purpose of His submission. Look at verse 8. He says, he says I'm under authority, having under me soldiers. You see, he had power over others, but the reason he had power over others is because others had power over him. He was in the chain of command in the Garden of Eden. Adam's authority was to rule under divine instruction, and he had power as long as he obeyed. And as soon as Adam disobeyed, he lost the power, and he got kicked out of the garden. The purpose of spiritual submission in the home, in the church, and in the life of a Christian is to further God's kingdom. We do what we do because we love Jesus Christ. Amen? We do what we do because there's a cause. We suffer because there's a cause. I want to ask you this morning, what do you think about the cause? Are you willing to suffer? David walked out there on that plane and stood up to Goliath. Why? Because there was a cause. The cause was the glory of God. What do you think about the cause this morning? We'll endure a lot of stuff because of the cause. Back probably 40 years ago, I was, uh, I was going up Jordan Lane in my 57 Chevrolet had flames painted on the side, and I was tuning along up Jordan Lane, and I came up to, uh, I was coming up to Sparkman Drive, and there's a Texaco station right there, and there was a, a station wagon there, and these two girls was trying to load this motorcycle into the back of a car. And there was a, a young boy standing there, and so, you know, I thought, well, they need some help. And I, I was young, single, you know, and, and, and always yeah. looking for the opportunity to find and meet some sweet young thing that needed help somewhere. And so being the nice, helpful kind of guy that I was, I got out and I strolled over there and I said, uh, I said, hey, girl, do y'all need some help here? Can I help you with something? And they said, yes, this is our younger brother and, and the motorcycle has quit running and we need to put it in the back of the car to, uh, to, to get it home. Hey, no problem here. <laughs> oh, aren't you lucky I stopped by. <laughs> and I reached down there. It was at night. And I reached down there and I grabbed that. Or I put it in the back of that car. And I turned around and I got in my car and I drove off. He said, Preacher, why didn't you talk to him? When I reached down there and grabbed him, grabbed it, I grabbed the exhaust pipe. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, <laughs> so I took that motorcycle and I put it in there and I said, oh, my girl, I'm feeling <laughs> And I got in my car and I pulled my hand and I'm driving off. And then what I'm, getting at, what I'm getting at is we suffer an awful lot of stuff because of the cause, don't we? Amen. <laughs> I'm sure they, they just, oh, handsome stranger, what a hero. <laughs> yeah, yeah, right. <laughs> But, but we suffer stuff because of the cause. We, we suffer because we love the Lord. The principle of authority is all authority is derived from God and is only experienced by submission to divine authority. The Bible says in 1 Corinthians chapter 6 and verse number 20, For ye are bought with a price. In other words, we are owned by Jesus Christ. Amen. He owns us. 
If you accepted Christ as your Savior, then you accepted the price that He paid. And so now, you belong to Him. Now you don't have a choice as to whether you ought to go to church or not go to church. You belong to Him. Now you don't have a choice as to whether you ought to give or not give. You belong to Him. Now you don't have a choice as to whether you ought to pray or not pray. You belong to Him. Now you don't have a choice. As it, we have no choice. Our will is surrendered to Him and we have no rights. Amen. We are supposed Amen. to be yielded Amen. to Him and when we're Thank yielded you. to Him, you, He will lead us in the path of righteousness and He'll Amen. lead us to the place of blessing Amen. and He'll lead us to the place where He can take care of us. I was reading the book. I, I, I found the book the other day. I got a bunch of books out of the attic. And one of the, one of the old books was uh, captured by the Indians. And it has several stories about people back in the 1700s who were captured by Indians. And one of these guys who was captured by the Indians, he was, they adopted him and they made him a brother. And, and very quickly, what, what happened was, he would go out hunting and he would come back, didn't have anything. And then he'd go out hunting and he'd come back and they didn't get anything. And the old Indian who he was trying to, it's kind of, his, kind of his stepfather, so to speak. The old Indian said, you know, the great spirit many times causes us to do without and many times causes us to be in want so that, so that we'll know that the great spirit will take care of us. Do you know why we have problems sometimes? Because God wants us to know that He will take care of us. He wants us to... That's why we have wants. Wants come in our lives so that, so that God can prove that He can meet our needs. I mean, I know how it is. Sometimes when you, you want to write a check to the church and you look at that and you think, you know, if I, if I give this... Uh, if I give this, I'm gonna I'm gonna really be short through the next of the month, and <laughs> just about the time you think you're gonna make the ends meet, somebody moves one of the ends. Amen. You know how that is. You've had an apple out of that bag. Yeah, I'm, I know. <clears throat> but yet, God, listen. God doesn't want us to have a big bank account. You know what He wants us to do? He wants us to trust Him. Amen. And, and I would rather, you say, would you rather, you know, like some people say, Lord, let me prove to you that winning the lottery won't spoil me. <laughs> well, I think it might. But you know why we didn't win the lottery? Because God wants us to trust Him. Amen. If I won the lottery, I would be tempted. I know, you say, oh, no, not you, preacher, not you. You're spiritual. You walk with God. No, I'd be tempted. <laughs> I'd be tempted to say, hey, you know, uh, I don't really need to pray the Lord take care of me. I've got it made. You know, and so when, when, we look at, when we look at the empty cupboard and then we look at the Bible, you know what I find in the Bible? God's going to take care of me. Amen. And He's going to take care of you too. You know, we, we worry about the Dow Jones Industrial Average. We worry about the, you know, depression or something. I'm not worried about a stock market crash. I was a flop during the boom. I mean, it's not really going to, you know, it's not really going to make a whole lot of difference with me. I mean, yeah, but, but, but I've trusted God. Listen, God's going to take care of me. And, and I trust Him. So the purpose of authority is that we can have power to serve God. Listen quickly to the power of authority. Look at verse 8 again. For I also am a man under authority, having under me soldiers, and I say unto one, Go, and he goeth, and to another, Come, and he cometh, and to my servant, Do this, and he doeth it. Because he was submissive to his authority, he had authority, and he had authority in three different areas. Look at it. First of all, he had a directive power. He had authority in directing others. Look at, look at verse 8 again. He was in command, and he says there in verse number 8, I say unto one, go, and he goeth. That's power for leadership. That's power to be able to help others as they try to serve the Lord. He was in command because he was under command. You must submit to God. You must submit to God day by day. Submit your abilities to God. Submit your talents to God. Submit your thoughts to God. Give it all to God. And if you want to help others, you've got to be submitted to God. Amen? Amen. You've got to have it. Now, you can lead others. You know, you, you just, you, you can lead others in the sense of trying to get them to do something, but when they see your devotion, God will take your devotion and your submission and God will use it in their lives and they will be devoted, devoted and submissive too. You know, many times parents, 
uh, they can't control their children. And they're frustrated without, you know, about what their kids are doing. They, they seem to be without control. And yet, the, the parents are not submissive to God. And if you're not submissive to God, don't expect your children to be submissive to you. It's a, it's a divine uh, pecking order, so to speak. Submissive, well-behaved children come from submissive, well-behaved parents. And so we must, be, uh, we must be yielded to God so that God can give us power to help others in our lives. It's a directive power for leadership. Secondly, it's an attractive power, and that's for fellowship. Look what he said there in verse number 8 again. And to another come, and he cometh. It's a power to invite others to the Lord. It's a power to invite others into fellowship. You see, if you're right with God and you love God and you invite others to come to the Lord or to come to God's house or to fellowship with God's people, the Holy Spirit uses your submission and you have an attraction and they'll come. God can use you. Probably the most effective uh, testimony is somebody uh, who has yielded to the Lord and, and has yielded their life to the Lord and God is using them. There is a divine attraction in their life. You show me somebody that doesn't love to come to church and I'll show you somebody who is, has an authority problem. There's somebody that has something in their life somewhere that's, that's taken the place of God. They're, they're worshiping money, or they're worshiping power, or they're worshiping prestige, or they're worshiping pleasure. But when you're worshiping the Lord Jesus Christ, there's just something about coming to God's house. Amen? Amen. There's just something about being here. When you're submissive to the Lord, there's a directive power for leadership. There is an attractive power for fellowship. And then there is a creative power, and that is for stewardship. Look at it again. He says there in verse number 8, And to my steward do this, and he doeth it. It's a, it's a power to get things done. It's a power to see God work in your life. You know, how many times have we seen somebody... You know, I learned to preach at Cook County Jail. And... Uh, you may debate whether I know how to preach or not, but that's where I started anyway. Let me put it that way. I learned to preach. I started preaching at Cook County Jail in Chicago. And I would go there and I would preach and, and we'd bring, we'd bring up, we'd go by Wenzel's Donuts. Anybody ever heard of Wenzel's Donuts? Anybody? Yeah, up north. If you've been up north, they have them up there. And they'd save the day old donuts and they'd give it to us. So we'd go in there and we'd go in the dorms they would let us go up, and we would go in there, and I can't believe it, you know. I'd, there'd be 200 guys in this dorm room, and a, they were asleep. And I'd go in, and I'd hit them on the foot. Hey, guys, Protestant services downstairs. We've got donuts for you. Protestant services. And you'd wake them all up, and then they'd all come down. And, and that's where I started preaching. But you know, as I did that, and I'd see these guys, and I'd, I'd, I'd fellowship with the guys, and they'd get saved, and, and we'd go visit their family the next week. Uh, but a lot of times when you see these guys, you wonder. And, and you wanted to say, man, what wonderful things you could do if you would just yield your life to the Lord. You know, if you would just, if you would just straighten up and fly right. You know, but these, these people, they're not smart enough to live. Most people are not smart enough to live out from under the subjection uh, or, or the authority of the law. That's why the jails are full. Now, there are people who are smart enough to do it, and, and, and they do it. We call them politicians, but I'm, I'm not going to go there. But, uh, but anyway, you know, you, you see somebody with so much potential. You know, that's why I, I, I try to get these young men to help me up here and, and different ones who want to do something. I want you to be excited about serving, and I want to give you a place to serve. I want you to preach in junior church. I want you to talk to your neighbors. You see, there are some wonderful things that you can do if you would just yield your life to God. God will make something out of you. We see people and we wonder, man, why... I sure wish they would make something out of their life. Well, I look at God's people and I think the same thing. You know, if you would yield your life to the Lord, there would be a directive, a directing attraction. There would be an, an attraction of folks that would want to be like you. You'd have an influence and, and, and you'd have the ability to create. And God would use you in a ministry. And that's the threefold power in subjection. And I want you to see quickly, and I'm going to close with this, the pattern of authority. Here was a man who loved much. 
He loved the Jewish nation. He loved his servant. And you know, I, I, I spoke about it in the Sunday school class this morning. Jesus didn't come primarily because he wanted to save us. Jesus didn't come primarily because he wanted to, uh, to, to be the Messiah over the nation of Israel. Jesus didn't come to the earth primarily because he wanted to go to, go to Calvary. All those things are true. And all those things happen. But you know why Jesus came and left his throne in glory? You know why he came here? The Bible says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. You know why he came? Because he loves you. He came because he loves you and he wants you to be right with him. You know, we get we get all of our we get all of our little religious things going. We get all of our we get all of our religious programs going. Now, Brother Foots, we talk about it. We get this program going, and we get this program going, and we got this church going this way, and we tend to forget about the love of God. Listen, he loves you. And more than anything else, he loves you. But I failed this week. He loves you. But I stumbled this week. He loves you. I, I messed up this week. He loves you. Man, my kids, they, you know, they're, they're my kids. And we went to a, we finally do our Christmas. Uh, my family, I don't know why, my family is a, is a few months behind or a few weeks behind anyway. So we, we did Christmas yesterday, which, you know, we finally got together down at my brother's. And my, my youngest son, he's got four kids. And they pulled up. And this beautiful girl gets out of the car. And I'm thinking, well, who in the world is that? She comes walking up. That's my granddaughter. She's grown two feet since I saw her last. And she looks beautiful. I couldn't, I couldn't believe it. Now, there's my son. There's my other son. There's my daughter. They were all there. And you know what? They're not perfect. But you know what? I love them. And, and I want folks to be good to them. You know, you think, well, you know, my, my son, my son's, you know, his wife is a, I'm not saying this about mine. Hey, if you're listening to this, not you, Jody, okay? Uh, <laughs> but you say, oh, no. <laughs> you say, boy, my, 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 my daughter's husband is just a, he's just a, he's an ogre. I, I, don't, I really don't like that guy. Listen, it doesn't matter. As long as she likes him, I'm happy. And, and as long as we do what God wants us to do, as, as long as we're submissive to Him, even though we make mistakes, He still loves us. He deals with us out of love. He's not going to deal, hey, I can't wait till you mess up again. I'll knock you down. I'll slap you so hard your grandkids will be born with a headache. I'll hit you. No, no, that's not what God's going to do. God, have you had an apple out of that bag, Miss Nancy? Yes, I know, I know. <laughs> but look, God loves you. He loves you so much that He died for you. Listen, if He loves you enough to die for you and give His life for you, don't you think He'll take care of you today and take care of you tomorrow? He's going to take it. You see, we trust Him with our soul but we, we're, we're scared to trust Him with our lives. We, we trust Him with our soul, but we're, we're, we're scared to trust Him with our finances. We trust Him with our soul, but we're, we're, we're scared to trust Him with our, with our dating life. Or we're, 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 we're scared to trust Him with our, with our social life. Listen, if you will put yourself under the authority of Jesus Christ, he will revolutionize your life and He'll change your life. He'll make a difference. You say, my life's good. He'll make it better. I, you know, I never dreamed life could be as good as it is right now, but God can make it better. I don't want to stop. You know, I want to say, Lord, this is great. You know, I, I really love these blessings. I just want to stay here. Uh-uh. I want a new blessing. Amen? Amen? I want a new one tomorrow. And I want a new one the next day. I'm thankful that you're here. God bless every one of you. I'm glad you're here. But I want more people to come. Amen? Amen. I want more people to come near and, and, and get near the spout where the glory comes out. Amen? Amen. Let's bow together in prayer. Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you so much for loving us.